and protecting water resources. The International Water Association is the global network of water professionals working on the most pressing water issues. We bring people together to share knowledge, experience and know-how and find new ways to safeguard and deliver water supplies for the future. We connect scientists, practitioners and communities so that pioneering research can underpin new solutions. We foster technological innovation, support sustainability and drive best practice through international frameworks and standards. Inspiring change to deliver a better water future for all.
good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is João Grillo. I'm the IWA um, Events and Awards Director. I would welcome you all here this afternoon. And to start, I would like you to rise up for the national anthem of uh, the Sri Lankan Republic, please. to proceed by inviting our honorable guests to a, a traditional ceremony in Sri Lanka, which is the lighting of the traditional lamp. Uh, I will uh, be calling our distinguished guests for the lighting of the traditional lamp. Uh, if you then could also rise for the, the uh, lighting of the lamp. I'd like to invite um, first honorable uh, Minister of Foreign Relations and, uh, and former Minister of, Minister of Water Supply and Urban Development, Honorary Minister uh, Dinesh Kawardena uh, to proceed to the uh, lighting of the oil lamp. Uh, the State Minister, Minister of Urban Development, Housing and Water Supply, Honorary uh, the State Minister Vasudeo and Anawa Kara. Um, the uh, Dr. Priyat Bandu Wikrema, Secretary of Minister of Urban Development, Housing and Water Supply. Um, the Secretary, Ministry of Ports and Shipping, and former Secretary, City Planning, Water Supply, and Higher Education, Mr. MMP Mayadune. Um, the additional Secretary Technical of the Ministry of Water Development, Housing, and Water Supply, Ms. Mangalika. Uh, the additional General Secretary of the National Water Supply and Drainage Board, and Secretary of uh, the Governing Member Sector of IWA in Sri Lanka, Mr. Tilina Vijatunga. The 
uh, IWA president, uh, Mrs. Diane Daha, and the IWA executive director, Professor Kala Varavamurti. Please rise up. And I would now like to proceed by inviting Professor Kala Varavamurthy, Executive Director of the International Water Association, on stage. Good afternoon. Dear distinguished guests, dear members of IWA, dear water professionals and Congress participants, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the 2019 IWA Water and Development Congress and Exhibition in my home country of Sri Lanka. My name is Kalani Devayavamuthi and I'm the CEO of the International Water Associations. Let me begin by welcoming our distinguished guests, the Honorable Vasudeva Nanayakara, the State Minister of Urban Development, Housing and Water Supply, Madam Diane Daras, the President of the International Water Association, the Honorable Dinesh Guna Ward Tana, the Minister of Foreign Relations, Mr. Tilina Vijaytunga, the Congress President and the additional general manager of the National Water and Supply and Sewerage Board, Dr. Priya Banda Vikrema, Secretary, Minister of Urban Development, Housing and Water Supply, Mr. Maya Duna, Secretary for the Ministry of Ports, Shipping, and, Mr. L, and Mrs. L. Mangalika, additional secretary for the Ministry of Urban Development, Housing and Water Supply, and Mr. R. H. Ruvinis, the general manager of the National Water Supply and Drainage Board. This Congress would not have happened without the strong support and enthusiasm of all of you. And of course, without the direct support of our main sponsors. Pow China, Larson Tubro, Vitek Warburg, LIH Technology Hawan Company, and our many strategic partners. we have the logos of the strategic partners. Yeah. Okay, so these are our strategic partners. As I'm talking to you right now, around 600 to 800,000 people are flying in a plane at an altitude of about 11 kilometers above the Earth's surface and are traveling at speeds of 800 kilometers an hour. Many of you have done this to come here to Colombo. In fact, it is estimated that any given time during the day or during the night, an average of 750,000 people are airborne. All of these people are provided with safe drinking water, good sanitation, and their wastes are safely handled. Isn't it amazing that in the 21st century, humankind is capable of permanently maintaining the population of a reasonably sized town of 750,000 people 
11 kilometers high and providing them with all of their essential services. But you know what's even more amazing, or I should say astonishing, is that in the same century, we have not yet managed to provide safe water and sanitation to all our fellow human beings on the ground. And this is not due to a lack of trying. When we look back in history, it is the management of water and sanitation that has determined the longevity and the exuberance of civilizations. As I said, I'm from Sri Lanka. And here, we have great examples of water heritage and sustainable water management. In Sri Lanka, over two and a half thousand years ago, the great kings of the past developed one of the, one of the finest hydraulic civilizations of the world to deal with water scarcity in the dry zones of the country. The kings built a sophisticated network of small tanks connected by canals and large reservoirs in order to collect and redistribute every single drop of rain that fell on this beautiful land. The tanks were built in a cascading system using natural topography. And the main goal of these systems was to save and reuse water in order to support and sustain economic development. You know, people managed to successfully cultivate rice all year round in the dry zones, while at the same time, communities were provided with drinking water supply. But more importantly, the kings were visionaries. They also recognized the need for humans to live in harmony with nature. So certain areas of these tanks were dedicated to support animals from the forest and to support biodiversity. In fact, it is the only man-made ecosystem that managed to keep a perfect ecological balance for centuries, while at the same time providing flood control and water conservation. The thinking behind the design of these ancient tank systems was poorly understood by modern engineers, and they became neglected and abandoned, particularly during the colonial era. But we have now realized their importance, particularly in the face of climate change. And so the government of Sri Lanka is rehabilitating and rejuvenating these tank systems. And they're doing this by reviving the wisdom from the nearly forgotten past. This collective memory is shaping the water-wise future of this beautiful country. It is indeed lessons learned that allow us, as a collective, to rethink and reimagine the future of water. We can see this in how the lessons from the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, have now helped shape the transition to the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Yes, we're back to aspirational goals, but with a difference. We have become more pragmatic and more grounded in humanist values. And this is the golden thread that runs through this Congress. The fact that interventions must have at their core the philosophy that no one is left behind. And this is a non-negotiable objective. And that it is no longer just about access to improved sources and facilities, but it's about safe, equitable, reliable, and affordable services for everyone. So in the next four days during this Congress, you will be having discussions on a range of topics that all contribute in some way or another to the delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals. At the International Water Association, we believe that we are at the dawn of the golden age of sanitation and that emerging economies have a unique but fleeting opportunity to change the way they think about water and sanitation, to rethink how water is used, how water is reused. Should water systems and their infrastructures be centralized or decentralized, linear or circular? And should we have sewers or not? These will be the key questions discussed and debated during this Congress. The Congress also brings together researchers, innovators, and practitioners 
to facilitate the development of nimble and affordable solutions which will help emerging economies to leapfrog from the legacy of clunky, costly, centralized systems to more distributed and circular approaches. We will talk about how digital water is an enabler that allows us to transition to this new normal of one water. You see, opportunities just don't happen. You create them. This is the spirit of the IWA community and of this Congress. When I think about thought leadership and agenda setting, it is all of you that are constantly pushing the boundaries of water science, technology, and innovation. And it is at Congresses like this where you create those opportunities to shape the water sector, to shape our water future, to meet with experts in the industry with whom we have always wanted to meet and interact, to exchange, to network, to share memories, to learn, to teach, and to empower ourselves to become modern water thinkers. And opportunities just don't happen. We create them. The IWA, through its 50 specialist groups, with its presence in 140 countries, develops new ideas and solutions that inform and influence global practice and policy. You see, the institutional heart of IWA has been in existence for more than 70 years. But this year, 2019, is very special because it is the 20th anniversary of the marriage of the two associations, WSA and IAWQ, that came together in 1999 to form the IWA that we all now know and cherish. So opportunities just don't happen. It's you and us working together that creates them. So again, welcome to the 2019 IWA Water and Development Congress and Exhibition. And so with this, I would like to now invite my president, Madam Diane Daris, to deliver her opening address. Diane, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Dear Excellencies, Honorable Vasudeva Nanayakakara, Mr. Tilina Vijetunga, dear Dulai, dear perceptive participants, delegates, dear water professional, dear friends. We all agree on that humanity cannot thrive and survive without water. Cities cannot function without water. Agriculture, industry, and the environment are all vulnerable to water risks. The world faces an unprecedented challenge to ensure we have a sustainable water future that is capable of meeting these challenges. If IWA members are today mainly dealing with water services to the people, we more and more have to find a way to share the resources in between daily sanitation services to people, our core activity, with the need of industry and the need for more irrigation in agriculture to cope with the developing populations. Irrigation has been and is central to human development, and some civilizations have developed it further than others. As Carla said, Sri Lanka is a good example of that. In the 12th century, agriculture reached its zenith in this country. According to the chronicles, the King Parakramabahu I believed in it and I would like to quote him. He, dis he decided and he pushed that not allowing even a drop of rainwater to flow to the ocean without being used by man. What a wonderful vision for opening the IWA Water and Development Congress and Exhibition. However, the reality today, 800 years after, is not so brilliant around the world. The third commission of the United Nations relating to the human rights is preparing the resolution on safe 
drinking water and sanitation, which should be adopted in the General Assembly of the United Nations before the end of the year. I would like to quote the United Nations resolution. And I quote them. According to the joint monitoring program, if between 2000 and 2017 progresses have been made, the situation in 2017 is still not acceptable. At least 29% of the population lack of the human right water services. In fact, the percentage of population using only very basic drinking water service, not safely managed, is 19%. And even worse, 18% of the population don't, do not even have those very basic services. In sanitation, it's not better, even worse. 55% of the world population lack of access to human rights to sanitation. The percentage of the population using very basic sanitation is 29%. And nine, two billion people don't have even that. And we have to remind that 700 million people still practice open defecation, representing both population, 26% of the world population. The resolution of the, nation, the United Nations stated that United Nations is deeply alarmed that water, sanitation, and hygiene-related disease hit children the hardest, while noting that child diarrhea is a second leading cause of death in children under five years old. Carla has spoken about flights. It means that every day, the equivalent of three jumbo jets of children are dying because of that. The United Nations reaffirms that the human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation as components of the right to an adequate standard of living are essential for the full enjoyment of the right to life and all human rights. It reaffirms that states have the primary responsibility to ensure the full realization of all human rights and to endeavor to take steps individually and through international assistance and cooperation, especially economic and technical cooperation, to the maximum of their available resources with a view to progressively achieving the full realization of the rights to safe drinking water and sanitation by all, by all appropriate means, including in particular the adoption of legislative measures. UN calls upon states and international organizations to provide financial resources, help capacity building and technology transfer to help countries upon their request, in particular developing countries, to provide safe, clean, accessible and affordable drinking water and sanitation for all. This is where the role of organizations like IWA can speed up the process of development. As water professional, we have a lot of knowledge and solutions. But the development sector is very complex, with different models and structures. This requires for water professionals to be open to diversity. The Water and Development Congress and Exhibition is an event that bridges science, practice, and needs. As I just said, the needs are huge, enormous in terms of delivering the services people need. The IWA Water and Development Congress and Exhibition is different from the other big IWA Biannual Congress in the sense that it is a place where you have to face two days development reality. Water professionals meet development professionals and water needs. Needs in terms of technology, but also in terms of governance, financial means, human skills. We aim to bridge the adoption gap. However, while we want to promote cross-thinking, solutions that work well in a country are not necessarily the ones that will fit best other realities. We have to work around importing problems when we want to spread the solutions. 
understanding and sharing those challenges, the gaps, are key elements to identify effective solutions that adapt to the different realities. Listening to and sharing with other organizations and individuals is an important element for progress. That is the nature of this exceptional event. We must commit to di diversity. The skills that each of us bring to the table are different, but complementary. Economic and cultural diversity are key to find and implement the solutions humankind needs. As an example, we can refer to the United Nations who recommends in this resolution to promote both women's leadership and their full, effective and equal participation in decision-making on water and sanitation management, and to ensure that a gender-based approach is adopted in relation to water and sanitation programs. We, as a global community, have to think differently and act differently to respond to a new paradigm and to respond with the urgency our world demands. However, there is hope. There is hope for a sustainable future for all, especially for developing countries. Thanks to investment in innovative technology, to wash project, to desalination, we can bring the increased water security. Thanks to the potential for adopting nature-based solutions, we can expect more resilient, cost-effective and decentralized approaches. Thanks to the digital technology, as anticipated in the IWA Digital Water Program, utilities can transition from analog to digital management systems, offering new solutions and greater efficiency. It is also key that we grow our association in order to represent better the population who still do not have ac access to the human rights to water and sanitation. I welcome new members from developing countries in order to grow and improve our impact. We need them. Thus, I would like to take this momentum for to further thank you all for your contribution and presence. I would like to thank the IWA member and partners, and especially the ones who have shaped this IWA Congress, the program committee, and all of you who made the IWA Water and Development Congress exhibition 2019 happen. Ensure you have fruitful discussions and connect with one another. They will learn from you. You will learn from them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diane, for, a, for an inspirational speech. You know, the IWA Congress doesn't work without local support. And we have been very fortunate here in Sri Lanka to have had strong support from the Ministry and also from the National Water Supply and Sewerage Board. The key person in all of this, the engine that kept pushing and pushing, was Mr. Thilina Wijatunga from the Water Supply and Drainage Board. So I would very much like to now invite Mr. Thilina, the Congress President, to deliver his opening speech. Mr. Thilina. Honorable Dinesh Gunawardana, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Skills Development, Employment and Labor Relations. Honorable Vasudeva Nanakkara, the State Minister of Water Supply. Honorable uh, Dr. Priyadbandu Vikrama, the, uh, the Secretary to the Minister of Urban Development, Housing and Water Supply. Mr. Priyanta Mayadunne, the Secretary to the Ministry of Ports and Shipping. Uh, Mrs. Mangalika, the Additional Secretary Technical Chair, Joint Operation Committee. Representatives from foreign missions, donor agencies, especially Asian Development Bank, World Bank, JICA, and AFD. All secretaries to the Ministry of Water Supply, additional secretaries, the senior officials from sister organizations, 
and the Director General Irrigation, all Sri Lankan organizing committee members, Ms. Diane, Diane, the President of International Water Association, Kala, Professor Kala, the, the excellent director of IWA, colleagues and friends. Even though Sri Lanka is blessed with an annual rainfall over 2,000 millimeters, Sri Lanka faces its own unique problems in drinking water sector. The geographical diversity and the climate variation in Sri Lanka makes the drinking water issues even more complicated and complex. Being a country in which one third of its population engage in agriculture, competing demands for agriculture and water for drinking is becoming a major issue. One could assess the seriousness of the water quality issues, which is evident from the chronic kidney disease epidemic, which has made the made a serious health impact on several provinces in Sri Lanka. Over the last decade or so, Sri Lanka had been attempting to develop its industrial and commercial sectors anticipating an economic growth, where the water supply services and infrastructure became, becomes a fundamental requirement. Supplying potable water to urban cities, industrial zones, commercial hubs, have been a major challenge, mainly due to water resource constraints and limitations. We have been exploring alternative options such as desalination, but at the same time faced with technical financial feasibility issues as the current water tariff is heavily subsidized. In a, in a nutshell, we could say that the drinking water sector has been going through a transition phase encountering quality and quantity issues while facing cost recovery and investment challenges. In addition, even though Sri Lanka has a healthy indicators on sanitation, for pipe water service coverage, Sri Lanka has to go a long way. In this backdrop, we were eager to network with the global knowledge hub to share experience and to learn from contemporary best practices in the drinking water field. We envisaged that there may be other countries which would have gone through this phase and we were eager to share the lessons learned by our international counterparts in tackling these issues. This persuaded and encouraged us to convince IWA to hold the 2019 Water and Development Congress and exhibition in Colombo, Sri Lanka. The IWA naturally became the best candidate for us to link with, considering its global reach and its worldwide network. We had no hesitation in promoting our partnership with IWA. Both parties work uh, in dedication and resolution, work towards a common goal. And we are here today being the proud host nation of the IWA 2019 World Water Development and Congress and Exhibition. The government of Sri Lanka gave us clearance to go ahead and extended its fullest cooperation to make this event a success. Under the stewardship of the Water Ministry over the last year, we as a team worked tirelessly to materialize this event. First and foremost, we would like to extend our gratitude to our former secretary, Mr. Maya Dunne, and our additional secretary technical, Ms. Mangalika, and the ministry staff for giving us the courage and the guidance to come so far. We do not do justice if we do not recognize the support extended by the universities, especially the engineering faculties of Boratua, Peradenia, Ruhuna, and Jaffna, who supported us all the way up to this point. From the inception, we had a very cordial relationship with Iowa, overseas team, and working with them was a pleasure. 
we set up several working committees, such as main coordinating committee, delegation committee, local delegation committee, exhibition committee, conference committee, and so on. And I'm telling you now, the commitment and the dedication shown by those teams were exceptional, and we would not have been here if not for the team spirit and the dedication shown by those committees. We were well on track until the unfortunate Easter Sunday incident threw us into a spin. Imagine the confusion and the uncertainty that engulfed us when you have to organize an event of this magnitude with international involvement in a uncertain circumstances. Then came the second bombshell. That is, President's election to be held either in November or December, and the exact dates unknown. But already, the dates for Iowa conference had been reserved as, for, as a, from 1st to uh, 4th December, as the venues had to be booked in advance. You could imagine the uncertainty and tension that prevailed during that period. It was like shooting in the dark. But when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. The Iowa stood by Sri Lanka and did not let us down. We appreciate you for the trust you place on us and our motherland. You did not desert us at the time of need. From our side, we were amazed to see the courage and the resolution of Sri Lankan working groups as well. All of them in unison said, never say die. No turning back now. Let us go forward and excel. That is why we are here today. This is the resilience of our country. This is the spirit of Sri Lankans. It may be war, tsunami, Easter Sunday, but we never give up. Here we are today in full glory all done and dusted, and looking forward to propel the drinking water sector to the next level and give the, the much needed boost to the economic development of our motherland. When we look back now, there could not have been a better timing for this event to be held at this juncture. With the new government in place, and with boosting aspirations and spiraling hope, we all are looking forward to a new era of development and economic revival with enthusiasm. It is the time for new beginning, and it is the beginning of the Christmas season as well. We all could feel the hope and aspiration, the excitement in the air. You cannot ask for any better th timing. Our efforts have been finally paid off. His Excellency the President, has declared the policy of the new government. We have a golden opportunity to make use of this event as a morale booster to kickstart the drinking water sector development, keeping in line with stipulated government development policies. We are sure that we could have a healthy dialogue, knowledge sharing, and technology transfer during this conference. Most importantly, what we will finally achieve is the strong bond we could build with Iowa and strong network we could make with International Knowledge Hub, which will be immensely useful to all of us and in time to come. Last but not the least, I shall take the opportunity to mention about the National Water Supply and Drainage Board Research and Development Symposium, which will be held as a parallel event starting tomorrow. Getting an opportunity to amalgamate the R&D symposium of NWSDB together with Iowa Develop Water Development Congress is a huge boost to uplift the quality and standard of the NWS, our, our R&D symposium to be on par with international standards. Again, finally, on behalf of the Water Ministry, the management of the NWSDB and the Sri Lankan Organizing Committee we once again extend our sincere appreciation and gratitude to IWA for holding hands
with us all the way for 2019 IW Water, Develop, Water and Development Congress and Exhibition to see the light of the day, which means a lot to us and to our motherland. From Sri Lankan side, we will ensure and guarantee that 2019 IWA Water and Development Congress exhibition will be an absolute success. I wish all of you a very fruitful three days to come on behalf of Sri Lankan Organizing Committee. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Mr. Thilana, for your inspirational speech and for your kind words. And I must say, the hard work that all your committee members put in to make sure that this conference is a success. Now I would like to invite our chief guest, the Honorable Vasudeva Nana Yakara, to give the chief guest's address. Please, Minister. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Ayubo and Wanakkam. Honorable Dinesh Kunawadana, the Minister of External Affairs and Labor Relations, and etc. Madam President, Diane, I'll leave the rest of your name for difficulty in pronunciation. Kala Vairavamurthy, the CEO, Priyat Bandhu, the secretary to this ministry, of course, the minister being the prime minister. I am only the state minister. And all other secretaries and officials and organizers of this conference. It happens to be by luck and thanks to the universal franchise and political democracy that I am here at this podium instead of the former minister, which is a result of the last presidential election that changed the government. We invited the former minister Honorable Rauf Hakim, to be present at this event, and we expect him to be here at any time. Distinguished delegates, dear friends, who have come from far and near, it is indeed an honor for me to address this August gathering with more than, if I am right, about 600 participants from about 80 countries. We thank the International Water Association for choosing Sri Lanka as the host country for this all-important Congress of Water and Development. As a state minister for water supply and drainage, appointed a few days ago, I'm sure I will be inspired by this event for the work that I have to undertake as a new minister. My task will be made easier by what you will be discussing here in the next few days and the conclusions that you arrive at in regard to the all-important question of water issues. Our purpose is, as Kala said, water for all and at affordable prices and in sufficient quantities. 
the principal feature of our welfare state and society is this as one pillar, free education, another pillar. Free health is another pillar. Water and sanitation is the other pillar. These are the pillars on which our welfare state stands and our welfare society flourishes. Now I wish to briefly address you on our history and geography, but much of what I wanted to say has been stolen from me by the previous speakers. Your president even referred to Parakram Bahu the Great, our king, and what he said. So I am deprived of that. We are known as the pearl of the Indian Ocean, my motherland. 66,000 square kilometers. 5% of it is covered with internal water or internal waterways, including the large man-made tanks dating back 2,000 to 2,000 years of recorded history, recorded history. The Buddhist civilization that commenced with the advent of Arahat Mahinda Thero, the Buddhist missionary monk, the son of Emperor Asoka, our country developed and evolved into a new civilization. It is recorded that Arhat Mahinda Thero said to the king, Devanam Piyatesa, who was then the king of Anuradhapura and Sri, Sri Lanka, he said to the king that he is only the trustee of the resources of nature and not the owner. This was cited in a recent Supreme Court case, which upheld the right of the people to natural resources and therefore inalienable. This has set the tone of our culture and secondly, in our governance under all governing regimes. I also must mention the valuable contributions Hinduism later on has made towards the evolving culture. And also Christianity and Islam still later in their contribution towards this evolved civilization. Our country is blessed with an annual average rainfall. That figure was given by our director, 2,000 millimeters. Therefore, we have surface and groundwater in abundance. But yet we experience droughts and we also have a large number of communities with deficient water accessibility and supply. This is a contradiction, as you will see. We should have been able to solve this contradiction long ago with the kind of culture that we have discussed and the history that we have inherited. However, it was not to be for other reasons, to which I will come later. Well, one thing that strikes me as another contradiction is like the abundance of water but scarcity of water. Fewer people who can afford consume and use a large proportion of water, while a large number have a deficiency in water. This too is a contradiction in almost all developing countries, made worse by the neoliberal economic structures. We have about 100 river basins with five major rivers with a perennial flow, having its sources located in the central highlands. The uneven development, unevenly developed economy has resulted in polarized urbanization and the large rural sector. 
this corresponds with the density of the population. Our aim is not merely to build smart cities, which is what Colombo and its periphery is developing into, but is to build inclusive cities, even if not smart. Further, our new government intends to give the facilities of the city to the rural regions. And this we have been doing in the previous times when our governments were in power, allocating large amounts of money for the development of the rural sector. The difficult rural sector, the difficulty of the rural sector will be overcome only when the facilities are available like electricity and water. We thought as a dictum that facilities of the city to the rural regions and the environmental bliss of the rural regions into the cities. We are faced with the daunting challenges in providing safe drinking water to all the people and more urgently to the rapidly increasing population in Colombo and other cities. It has been said that our expenditure on the health will significantly reduce with the accessibility for all to safe drinking water. More drink, safe drinking water, lesser hospitals. This has been what one of my friends, Dr. Anton, said to me, provide safe drinking water, then you will have least expenditure on your health. Not less urgent is the same need, that is the availability of water in the dry zone areas. Once again, the chronic kidney diseases that is increasing in those areas has been referred to by an earlier speaker. It is connected with water they consume, as the scientists have begun to understand. Thankfully, Sri Lankan mentality has been very wise and appropriate in regard to urban migration. Migration is one problem which relates to the issues of water availability. I say our mentality of our people have been wise and appropriate because they have their own properties or ancestral homes in the villages from which they were not easily uprooted. They are deeply rooted there and settle in their own properties or ancestral lands or homes. If this were to be the pattern with less migration into the urban areas, as has been noted, Sri Lanka has the least migration and urbanization in South Asia. It's supposed to be 1.36. What we need will be public transport systems. I don't want to go into another sphere. But that would check the unnecessary urbanization. The water and environmental issues vary from city to another or to the non-urban areas. The mother of all issues related to water is the destruction of catchment areas and the loss of forest cover and the misuse of chemicals in agriculture at high elevations. Of course, these issues arise partly out of lack of proper employment and income to the people who are in the lower segment of the population, and partly due to the corruption of officials and, irres and, irrespons and partly to the irresponsible, greedy, unscrupulous rich. But these 
in contrast to our 2,000-year-old culture, which has been contemporarily unique in the sustainable water resources management systems and practices that we had. Our ancient cities had running water facilities and sanitation too. We have to ask ourselves why we have degenerated over the years. Our own long-term people's interests were overrun by the colonizers who denuded our forests, the richest resource we had. As has the UN now realized and underscored, development is not merely growth. It is not merely in economic terms. It means inclusive human development of all people and no one to be left behind. Economic development is a means to an end. The end is ultimately human development. Our new president, His Excellency Gautabhya Rajapaksa, emphasized that all development should be people-centric and any development should reflect in the standard of living of the people. In our culture, the pollution of water or the waste of water is considered a sin and there is a veneration of water. In the past, every village had its own large storage of water in the village tank. Looked after by the villagers, we had thousands of such tanks, most of which are today among the ruins. A large number of our ancient irrigation canals and anikas were destroyed by the colonial rulers in the retribution and repression when the people raised rebellion for independence. Therefore, rightly, we are entitled to compensation. That will be taken up later on, I suppose, at the UN. Now, our new government has undertaken, like few previous ones, to harmonize development with environmental conservation and enhancing the quality of life with better incomes and this by ensuring social welfare. In this endeavor, as matters our previous government succeeded in providing electricity to the entire population, which I believe is a harder task than providing water. I believe it is our task now to provide safe drinking water and usable water to all citizens living in all parts of the country. Up to now, I have the figure of 51% is provided with safe drinking water. Tap ball. International cooperation has helped us to start on many water supply projects for which we express our gratitude. I'm sure International Water Association will support us in our efforts to mobilize funds. There is plenty of rain here these days, unusual for this time of the year. Probably it is a celebration of our Water and Development Congress. And to welcome you, the rains have come. Please find excitement and joy seeing our unique island and meeting our smiling, hospitable people and take back present memories of your visit here. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister Vasudeva, for a wonderful speech. Okay, so now we're going to have some light uh, entertainment, um, and we have a wonderful dance performance by the Chana Upali performance, uh, Performing Arts Foundation, and they will perform a piece called The Pearl of the Indian Ocean. So please, if we could welcome the Chana Upali Performing Arts.
Throughout the ages, travelers from all corners of the world have journeyed to a mystical and magnificent island nestled in the heart of the Indian Ocean. All through history, Throughout the ages, travelers from all corners of the world have journeyed to a mystical and magnificent island nestled in the heart of the Indian Ocean. All through history, this island nation has been referred to by many a name, such as Taprobane, Serendib, the granary of the East, and still to this day, the pearl of the Indian Ocean. Commencing their day by paying homage to the sun, the people of the island work the fertile soil that nourishes an entire nation. Ancient kings regarded the soil as a giver, a life, and fed it through intricate man-made waterways and great lakes. Thank you. 
the island nation sought medicine and healing from Mother Nature. Healing rituals were performed to cleanse the body and mind of impurities through the recital of spiritual chants called slokas. The study of astrology was central to the ancient system of education. Men of wisdom sought counsel from the stars and read the future looking at planetary positions. Time, space and energy were harnessed in the art of movement and traditional drumming which gave rise to the traditional dances of Sri Lanka.
what a wonderful, wonderful performance. And a beautiful way to start this Congress, show, showcasing the grace of Sri Lanka to all of you. I just want to acknowledge the Honorable Ralph Hakim, who has just uh, walked in to the meeting, to the, to the Congress. He was the former Minister of City Planning, Water Supply, and Higher Education. And he was very instrumental in bringing the Congress here, and, and he gave a lot of support to us. So thank you very much, Honorable Ralph Hakim, for all your help and support. Now, the IWA is a membership organization. And at this Congress, we celebrate the achievements and successes of our members and the global water community. So we shall now begin the IWA Water and Development Awards. The IWA Water and Development Boards have two categories. The first is research, and the second is practice. The research award recognizes high quality, disruptive, and impactful research in the areas of water and sanitation with a focus on low and middle income countries. The Practice Award celebrates outstanding accomplish, 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 accomplishments in the practice of forward thinking applications and solutions to advance safe water and sanitation in low and middle income countries. This year, the awards attracted an unprecedented level of interest. We had 74 nominations from 29 countries. And we put together a high quality judging panel from our membership who were responsible for judging these nominations. And let me tell you, they had great difficulty because many of those nominations were exemplary. But there can only be two winners. And today, we are going to, out to honor two outstanding professionals. I would like to invite my president, Diane Duaras, and the Honorable Minister Vasudeva to come to the stage to be part of the award ceremony, please. In the research category, we had three runners up, and all of their submissions were viewed as being exemplary. And I would just like to acknowledge Professor Damir Bravanovic from IHE Delft, the Netherlands, Professor Daniel Author from Missouri University of Science and Technology in the USA, and Professor Saravanamuttu Vigneshwaran from the University of Technology in Sydney, who also is originally from Sri Lanka. All of these people submitted outstanding applications, but they, but they were the three runners up. We can only have one winner, and the winner of this year's Water and Development Award for Research is Dr. Miriam Otto. I would like to invite Miriam to the stage to receive her award from the President, Madam Diaris, and the Honorable Vasudeva Nani Yakara. Dr. Otto's research work was in the area of resource recovery and reuse with a focus on business models. The award jury was convinced that her work will be instrumental in helping the financial sustainability of sanitation, and that her work goes beyond the technical challenges of Triple R, but provides policy recommendations. The judges were unanimous as they felt that the scientific rigor of her work was top notch. Congratulations, Dr. Otto, please. In the practice category, we had three runners-up. Can we have the practice category runners-up? We had Mr. Gerard Payon from the French Water Partnership, Asti Ondeo Aquafed in France. We had Dr. Nian Shi from Tsinghua University's Innovation Center in China. And we had Mr. Libby Johnson from Grand Vikas Odisha in India. Again, they all submitted outstanding applications, but they were the three runners-up. There can only be one winner, and this year's winner 
for the IWA Water Development Practice Award goes to Mr. Sikanda Sab Marinik. Please. Sikanda Saab is the CEO of the Sankalapal Rural Water Development Society. He started an NGO that installs rainwater harvesting recharge systems in bore wells in rural India. This low-cost technology has been implemented in extremely vulnerable dry regions and was considered by the jury to epitomize the spirit of the IWA Development Practice Award. To date, Sikinder Saab has implemented the systems across India in over 1,500 bore wells. Please, Mr. Sikinder, receive your award. And now we would like to take a joint photo with Miriam. Miriam, could you just come back? She's running. Come, come, come. I used to work with Miriam. She's fantastic. Miriam, please. Me? I must say it was fantastic that we had so many nominations and we had a fantastic judging panel and they took a lot of time to, um, to come up with the winners because it was very, very difficult. Okay, so as most of you are aware, what makes IWA Congresses famous is the strength of the program, its content, the new thinking and the rigor that underpins the new ideas that it promotes. And of course, the way that we ensure that the program is so strong and appealing is through our program committee that is formed by our members. Can I have the photograph of our members, please, yeah? It is only through our members' efforts that we are able to consistently deliver high-quality programs and content. So I would just like to acknowledge the hard work of the program committee for the 2019 Development Congress who put together such a fantastic program. If we could please show our appreciation to these individuals. Now the chair of the program committee was a very esteemed person and we are so happy and honored that he has agreed to deliver the keynote address during this inaugural session. So it is my great pleasure to invite Dulai Kone to the stage to deliver his keynote. Dulai is the Deputy Director of Water and Sanitation Hygiene at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He is disrupting the traditional models of sanitation by reinventing the toilet and reimagining how we deal with fecal sludge management. He is responsible for shaping the Foundation's efforts in birthing a new sanitation industry that focuses on serving the, urban, the poor communities in developing countries. He is leading the global efforts to commercialize transformative sanitation technologies. Dulai, we are all really honored to have you here, and we are very keen to learn about your vision on partnerships to accelerate the dawn of the golden era in sanitation. Please. Thank you, thank you, Kara, for, for the invitation, for extending this invitation to me and allow me to be, to be here today. Honorable Minister and 
like you said, I won't make a mistake trying to pronounce your, your name, but my neighbor, I believe, is Minister Dinesh, and Honorable Minister who just arrived, dear secretaries, and dear delegate, it's a great honor for me to be here today and speaking partly on behalf of the program committee which uh, Carla just shared. But also I want to share some of the work that I believe we should keep doing together if we want to grow the impact of our work in, in these communities. First, I was really impressed by the performance, okay? So as an African, I also like music and I felt that sometimes I need to Maybe I will learn some of those moves, and when we invite you guys from Sri Lanka in Africa, we'll try to, <laughs> to do some additional move, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Miriam, when I heard your name, I thought maybe I should change my keynote, because I wish I was able to explain today to everyone in this room what you did in this publication and in this book. It's amazing. If you are under 40, can you raise your hand? Okay. There's enough knowledge. This is like a library of what tomorrow, the tomorrow of sanitation looks like. This is what Miriam has, has, has written. It's really worth, worth reading. Let me start by saying thank you to all the committee uh, members. We are able to work remotely today, but we can do great things together. Most of these people, I would meet them for the first time this week. Some I knew before. But thanks to internet and the great connectivity, you know, technology is evolving in many domains, not on sanitation, but many domains. So thanks to technology, we were able to come together and and propose a program which I believe is very compelling, that everyone here, uh, I really hope, you would leave the conference with very strong relationship and very strong uh, partnership. I also want to thank the, the CEO, actually, Carla and the Secretariat, for also choosing those members and making sure that we have great representation. If you've seen on the pictures, They've tried their best, their best to make sure that this is gender balance. We strive to do that. It's not something we have to celebrate. It's like the normal thing to do, okay? If you're coming for the next Congress and you are a woman, bring another woman colleague. If you are a man, bring a female colleague, okay? So that's how we're going to keep striving and achieving our gender balance. So we want to do that in our work. Let's show it like when we come also on, on stage. This is some of the issues we are, we, are, we are discussing, okay? Water is becoming a scarce economic resource. But we need water to do many, 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 many things. Many people in our profession, like myself, have been educated to use water to drive sanitation solution. And what I want to share with you, maybe it's the time to rethink that. Maybe it's the time to think, to think differently because water is not no more available. And the concept of using water to drive sanitation is not moving fast enough. 21st century, six people out of 10 don't have decent sanitation solution. No matter what your water coverage is, you can't be celebrating any success. You cannot say, yes, we have 80% water supply, but you know what, sanitation would come tomorrow. No. People are sick and people die. And it has a huge burden on economic. When I say partnership, I'm not asking the top water engineer to become the top sanitation engineer or to become the top hygiene engineer. It's how do we extend our work, our relationship? How do we cross borders so we can talk to the others? Then together, maybe we can do bigger things. These numbers are huge. 
And I don't like recalling them all the time. I wish I would be on the stage one day and say, hey, here's a lot of money that people can make, so let's build an industry and let's go and make that money. This is something which breaks my heart. I mentioned technologies, you know, how we use technology to plan this conference. Me sitting in Seattle, other people in Sri Lanka, in India, in Europe, and we're able to plan great things together. When it comes to water and sanitation solution, there's a huge inequality in the world. I need to check the time with, it's not showing on the screen. If someone can display the time for me. So when it's come to water and sanitation solution, huge inequality in the world. If you are rich today, your toilet drink more water than yourself. That's what it is. Every single time you flush, five to 10 liter. You go and pee, five to 10 liter. You do number two, five to 10 liter. You're two years old, five to 10 liters. We cannot sustain that. We know it, and we need to take action. Things around us are changing. We have a you know, great representation from the government today. Three ministers, several secretaries, when I said, you know, raise your hand when you are below 40, it's on purpose, because I know when I was also below 40s, I used to be very impatient in those plenary sessions. Like, yeah, people talk too much. Why all these long speeches? Because this is the time where we have to translate for the policymakers what we have learned, what we know, what type of advice we need to give them. If we do that well, from this meeting, they can get empowered and they can take action. I believe that's also part of the plenary uh, session you are you're trying to, for some of the goal of the plenary session you're trying to achieve, Mr. CEO. Around the world, governments are campaigning with sanitation as a theme, and they win. India showed it. Very recently, Nigeria signed into law a bill to end open defecation by 2025. China, since 2015, launched a huge program on sanitation and toilet revolution. Several governments, if you are from a developing country, I can guarantee you this is one of the priority of your government. If you're working in a developing country or an emerging economy, this is one of the biggest priorities of your government. Not everyone is making big media coverage about this. Communities are asking, industries are asking, and government are coming forward. Now, as professional, how do we answer? I'm going to give some, some example. This is South Africa. South Africa did an amazing work on the policy level. This is the Ministry of Trade and Industry taking notice that water is becoming scarce and maybe disruptive sanitation technology can actually help save water. It's not the Ministry of Water and Sanitation. It's the Ministry of Trade and Industry. National policy action with budget behind to fund industries that can come up with what they call smart water toilet. It means toilet that doesn't drink drinkable water. Those toilets can make their own water today. Technology is available to do that. And the government is putting huge, significant budget to push for solutions like this. If you are industry players today, that's one place to go. Partnership here means the work that the Department of Water and Sanitation is doing together with the Department of Trade and Industry 
can actually help boost an economy in South Africa? Can we have similar effort in other places, in other countries? The market is there, for sure. This graph shows on the right side the coverage on on-site sanitation uh, system. Most cities, like large cities in the world today, don't have full coverage of sewer system. If we want to accelerate service provision in those countries and in those cities, it has to be a different solution. And the y-x is showing these are also the growing economy. It means the opportunity is there. I gave an example of South Africa. I gave an example of China, India, uh, next to, to us here. This is where the industry potential is today and has sector professional. We need to organize ourselves to extend our knowledge, extend services, extend technologies that would actually respond to these needs. And industry people are doing this on their own. Those logos here, these are multi-billion companies coming together some of them are members of IWA, our community. Others are not. Maybe they will come soon. Politicians are asking. Industries are organizing themselves. There are many others. You know, Fika Sludge Management Association is one newly created. You will hear about them very, very, very soon to, to do that. So this industry association called the Toilet Board Coalition is actually grooming entrepreneurs. It means if you are a young researcher today and you can invent a technology, you may have an opportunity to become part of the Toilet Board Coalition to apply to some of the accelerator and actually spin out a business. Because those companies are looking for the next disruptive ideas and business model to go to, go to scale. Now, when I stand here, many people have said, hey, Dula, you talk too much about on-site sanitation. Sewer is good. Yes, sewer is good. And I want to go back to this gentleman, Edwin. When sewer was invented, it was not going to make it to people's home on his own. It took some effort by gentlemen like this Edwin, to develop standards, service standards, that would make it mandatory for the technology to be available to everyone. The big difference today is because all those regulations and standards exist, the sewage industry is a powerful industry. It's a powerful economy. It's great. How do we do that for non sewer sanitation? Remember the numbers, 4.5 billion people. We have tried. We're launching initiatives, OK? And these are some of the work that I would like to open to our IW communities as well, as scientists, as professionals. We have to find ways to translate our science and knowledge into policy instrument, into regulation, into business model. If within this network we can build those relationships, I believe we can all achieve impact much faster. So this is an initiative to to try to standardize today what is on-site sanitation solution. How would you define that? How would you define performance? We can all complain about systems are not working, but I don't think we've done enough to sit together, 
with standardization bodies, with regulators, with policy makers, and have same, same language. Because if we can do that, then the investment community can be secure about performance of technology, performance of service, performance of product. Okay? This is just to give you what this standard would require. If we have to provide on-site sanitation solution today, people expect the same quality of service as a flush toilet that is connected to a sewer system. And that flush toilet takes a pathogen away from the family. My kids play in the bathroom and they never get sick. If I have a latrine at home, I would never allow them to go and play in the, in the latrine. That latrine has to be safe. So if we are providing quality service, equitable quality service to everyone, we have to abide to the same standard. So let's define standard for on-site sanitation services if we want to make this an equal industry as we did for the wastewater industry, as we did for the water supply industry, as we did for the telephone industry as well. These are some numbers to share with, uh, with the audience uh, what, the level of safety, what level of safety is required for, for standards like this. This is, this is an example. I'm not saying this is going to solve all the problems. This is only one standard. We need many more. If we are very serious about developing solutions and services that would last, that would provide same quality service as people would have with the sewer system, we need to develop much more of these standards. It means we have to translate our knowledge and innovation into those instruments as well. These are examples of technology that industry partners and universities are, are developing, toilet that will kill pathogens. Wouldn't that be great? That you don't have to worry about emptying, you don't have to worry about biosolids with contaminant. And those toilets can make their own, can make up their own water. They don't have to rely on drinkable water. There's not enough already. Every year we can support the day zero in this country, day zero in this city. Can be. See where system work where it worked greatly for 4.5 billion people. Maybe we can rethink. When I say the industry is, is developing this, it's not to say this is like new technologies. A company like SCG, SCG is a 15 billion US dollar company. Uh, yeah, 15 billion US dollar company in petrochemical industry. But they believe in communities where they work in order to make a lasting impact. Removing pathogens from the environment is actually key. And they're opening a business opportunity to actually extend sanitation services with toilet that would operate off-grid. No water supply going in, no sewer connection, and minimum electricity. This is another example from, from a company in, in China. You don't have electricity, you can use solar panel. And this is based on electrochemical reactors. And these are all technologies available in the IWA network. These are all technologies available in many, many universities and many publications already. How can we accelerate the transition, translation of those solutions into industry solutions? And I hope the work that we do within the network can actually uh, help inform. Decentralized sanitation system. Uh, I started my PhD work with you know, wastewater engineering and wetland system and activated sludge and pond system. When I started visiting treatment plant before I did my PhD, I visited many cities in Africa. I will visit a city the municipal sewer treatment plant is not working. And by the way, it is still true today. Then, I, 
across the road, I go to the industry, like Nestle is on the other side, and they use the same technology and it's working. If I ask the city, oh, we don't have the money, we don't have the expertise, we don't have the capacity, the other side, they have great incentive and it's work. And they hire people from the country, so the knowledge is there, the expertise is there. Why is not working for cities? Because most of the treatment plants that we have been building don't generate enough resources, revenue to cover costs. So part of the work that we do at the Gate Foundation is to call for innovators and industry players. How can you change this? And if you want to learn about, you know, what are those models? Miriam, raise your hand again, people can see you. She, she did a great job in her, in her book. I read every single page. I'm talking about toilet, and sometimes there's one difficult question that people don't necessarily address. Malodor. It stinks. Ferminic. I believe annual revenue is about, uh, I won't give the numbers, but I don't want to make mistakes. I think it's 20, about 20 billion. Uh, Ferminic is one of the largest, it's the largest fragrance company. If you use a perfume today, maybe probably you use some, a product coming from Feminec. They produce perfume for all the biggest uh, companies. Okay. They came up with a great technology that suppresses malodor in toilet. You can clean your toilet, you use a product to clean your toilet, it doesn't stink anymore. Solution like this can accelerate behavior change can help changing behavior, can help people accepting greater solutions, greater technologies as, as well. So my call today is to, to invite all of you, and especially uh, the, the young professional, to be part of this. This is, this is your opportunity. If you are here today, you made the right choice. If you are in this business, you made the right choice. Years before, I was like you. I was doubting whether this was the right thing to do. I can guarantee it's 100% the right thing to do. Okay? Be part of this. What you can do, you don't have to be engineers because in our water sector, we have traumatized so many people. We have traumatized our social scientist colleagues. We have traumatized the economists, the policy makers, because if they don't speak engineering language, then boom, 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 boom. It's not good. We need a much bigger family. If I'm an engineer and I invent something, I need someone to sell. I need someone to service. I need someone else to use it. We need to be open. The area you can choose to contribute are enormous. It's like you can build things from scratch. Imagine that. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, Dulai, for your very inspirational keynote. And I think everyone has learned a lot from this keynote. And as Dulai says, we are in the right business, and the opportunities are incredible. That was such a great way to kick off the Congress. And I'm sure you've energized everyone. Thank you, Dulai. So we've nearly finished the opening ceremony but I just have an announcement to make. Right after the opening session, we will inaugurate 
the exhibition with a traditional ribbon cutting just outside the main hall. And so I would very much encourage all of you to gather outside in preparation for the um, inauguration of our exhibition. So I'm going to close the inaugural session by saying that I really believe that this development congress will be the most successful development congress we have had to date. Two long years of preparation have made it so. And the Congress numbers substantiate that. We have nearly over 1,000 registered participants from over 70 countries. We expect to see around 3,000 visitors over the next four days. We had 415 abstract submissions, of which we were only able to select 115. We have 30 technical sessions, 30 workshops, 38 forums. So let's make this Water and Development Congress a great success. As I said earlier, opportunities don't happen. We create them. I now officially open the 2019 IWA Water and Development Congress and Exhibition. Thank you all, and enjoy the Congress, and enjoy Sri Lanka. <laughs>